Okay, so you're interested in Philadelphia. Bridges. Cool. History. Maybe grabbing a burger at the Hard Rock Cafe? At first glance. Those might seem like separate topics. Trust wow. us. There's a method to this deep dive. What's fascinating about Philadelphia is that it's a city built in layers. Layers of history you can practically touch as you walk its streets. Exactly. And we're going to peel back those layers, starting with... Believe it or not. That Hard Rock Cafe. I know. It sounds a little strange. But this particular Hard Rock Cafe, it's practically in the shadow of where America, as we know it, began. It's true. Picture this. It's 1682. William Penn, a Quaker with a radical vision, founds Philadelphia. Now keep in mind, most European cities at this time were, well, let's just say organized chaos was the best they could hope for. But Penn. He had something different in mind. Green country town. Okay, green country town sounds lovely, but what does that actually mean in practice? Do they just like plant extra trees? Think bigger. Penn envisioned a city with a grid system practically unheard of back then, interwoven with green spaces. He wanted order and nature to coexist, to create a city that nurtured both body and soul. So he was way ahead of the curve on urban planning. And this ties into the name Philadelphia, right? Absolutely. It's Greek for brotherly love, reflecting Penn's deep Quaker beliefs in equality and tolerance. He believed a well-planned city could foster a more just and equitable society. So we've got this utopian vision, this blueprint for a city unlike any other. But how did that vision actually play out? Did Philadelphia live up to Penn's high hopes? Well, that's where things get really interesting. You see, Philadelphia did flourish, but not always in the perfectly harmonious way Penn might have imagined. It turns out human nature has a way of adding its own twists and turns to even the best laid plans. Right, like even with the best intentions, you can't always predict how things will actually shake out in the real world, right? Exactly. And to really understand how Philadelphia evolved, we need to factor in another key element. It's geography. Specifically? The Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers. These weren't just scenic backdrops. They were the city's lifeblood. In a very literal sense. Okay, so we've got this idealistic city planned down to the last detail, but now we're bringing geography into the mix. How did the rivers shape Philadelphia's destiny? Think of the Delaware River as a grand avenue to the world. Ships from all corners of Europe and the Caribbean would dock here, bringing goods and ideas, transforming Philadelphia into this bustling hub of commerce and cultural exchange. So those rivers weren't just pretty, they were economic engines, turning Philadelphia into a powerhouse, right? Precisely. And here's where it gets really interesting, this strategic location, this role as a central hub. It also thrust Philadelphia into the heart of the brewing American Revolution. Here's where it gets really interesting. Picture those delegates from the 13 colonies huddled in heated debate right here in Philadelphia, their decisions shaping the future of a nation. And not just any delegates. We're talking Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, the titans of their time gathering in Philadelphia to debate, to strategize, and ultimately to sign the Declaration of Independence. This city wasn't just geographically important. It was the intellectual and revolutionary heart of a nation fighting to be born. So from those early days of green country town to the fervor of revolution, Philadelphia was truly a city on the rise. But revolutions have aftershocks, right? How did Philadelphia navigate the challenges of a young nation finding its feet? You're right. Building a new nation is never a simple task. And just like those early European cities, Penn sought to improve upon. Philadelphia had its own set of growing pains to contend with. I bet. But before we dive into those challenges, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back to uncover more of Philadelphia's fascinating story. All right, so before the break, we were talking about how Philadelphia had become the center of revolution and a key player in the birth of a new nation. And as with all births, it was exhilarating and messy all at the same time. Philadelphia, for all its careful planning, couldn't escape the challenges of a rapidly growing nation. So what were those growing pains? Did the city of brotherly love live up to its name? Well, let's just say those brotherly disagreements Penn hoped to avoid, they weren't entirely absent. Philadelphia grappled with issues of expansion, immigration, and social growing pains, just like any other booming city. But what's remarkable is how the city adapted and evolved. Okay, so it wasn't all smooth sailing, but Philadelphia found a way to navigate those choppy waters. What did that look like? Think about those rivers again. They weren't just about ships and trade, they were also about connection. And that brings us to a landmark that embodies Philadelphia's drive to bridge, 
divides both literally and figuratively the Benjamin Franklin Bridge. Now, there's an icon. You can't picture the Philadelphia skyline without it. It's massive. Absolutely. Completed in 1926, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world at that time, a true marvel of engineering. But its significance goes beyond its size. This bridge connected Philadelphia to Camden, New Jersey. Which is fascinating when you think about it. We started with William Penn planning this carefully ordered city, and here's this massive structure pushing those boundaries even further, making connections across state lines. Exactly, it was a powerful symbol of progress and interconnectedness. And if we connect this back to our starting point, remember that Hard Rock Cafe. Well, we it's situated right in the midst of this dynamic landscape where history and modernity collide. It's like you're standing on the very ground where revolution was ignited, and you can practically see the echoes of those call ships on the Delaware, while a 20th century engineering marvel looms overhead. It's a tangible reminder that Philadelphia has always been a city in motion, pushing boundaries and adapting to change. But this drive to connect and progress, it wasn't always applied equally. And there's one particular place in Philadelphia that serves as a stark reminder of that. You're talking about Eastern State Penitentiary. I have to admit, when I first saw it on our list of sources, I was a bit confused. What does a former prison have to do with hard rock cafes and brotherly love? That's the beauty of this deep dive, isn't it? It's about uncovering those unexpected connections. Eastern State Penitentiary might not be on the typical tourist trail. But it offers a window into a different side of Philadelphia's story, a side that forces us to confront some uncomfortable truths about justice and progress. Okay, you've piqued my curiosity. Tell me more about this Eastern State Penitentiary. What made it so different, so significant? Well, it was built in 1829, during a time when the idea of prison reform was gaining traction. Eastern State was intended to be a more humane approach to incarceration. The focus was on penitence, hence the name, with an emphasis on solitary reflection as a path to rehabilitation. Solitary reflection. Yeah. So we've gone from William Penn's vision of a city designed for community and connection to a place designed for isolation. It seems like a strange turn, doesn't it? It does, and yet it reflects a certain mindset of the time. The thinking was that by isolating prisoners, forcing them to confront their actions in silence, they would find true remorse and emerge as reformed individuals. That's quite a gamble. And how did it actually play out in practice? Well, that's where things get even more complicated. But before we delve into the realities of Eastern State Penitentiary, let's take another quick break. When we come back, we'll explore the prison's innovative design, its surprising amenities, and the controversial methods used within its walls. Stay with us. You won't want to miss this. All right, so before the break, we were venturing into the world of Eastern State Penitentiary, a place designed for solitary reflection and, hopefully, rehabilitation. It's a far cry from those bustling streets and that hard rock cafe we started with. It is indeed, and yet it's a crucial part of Philadelphia's story because even with its good intentions, Eastern State became a microcosm of the complexities and contradictions inherent in the pursuit of progress. Okay, so let's talk about the prison itself. What made Eastern State's approach to penitence so different from other prisons of the time? Well, for one thing, it was considered remarkably advanced for its time. Remember, we were talking about William Penn's emphasis on order and planning. That same spirit of innovation was applied to Eastern State, although with a very different goal in mind. The prison had individual cells, central heating, plumbing, even skylights, things most ordinary citizens didn't even have in their homes back then. Wow, skylights in a prison. That's not what I picture when I think of 19th century incarceration. What was the thinking behind those? They were called the Eye of God Skylights, meant to serve as a constant reminder to the prisoners that someone was always watching, even in their solitude. It was a powerful architectural metaphor for the moral weight of imprisonment. It's fascinating how even the design of a building can reflect the ideas and beliefs of a particular time. But this emphasis on solitude, on reflection, it seems like a recipe for despair, doesn't it? You're not wrong. And in practice, Eastern State's approach had its critics from the start. The enforced silence, for example, while intended to foster introspection, was often cited as being psychologically damaging. So this experiment in humane incarceration, did it actually work? That's a question historians and criminologists still debate today. Eastern State was certainly groundbreaking in some ways, but it also became a symbol of the challenges and limitations of prison reform. Which brings us to today. Eastern State is no longer a functioning prison, right? That's right, it closed its doors in 1971, and in a fascinating twist, it reopened as a museum in the 1990s. A museum? 
That's quite a transformation. What's it like to visit Eastern State today? It's really an experience unlike any other. It's like stepping back in time, walking through those cell blocks, seeing those skylights, and imagining the lives lived and lost within those walls. It's incredible to think that a place designed for isolation is now a place where people gather, learn, and engage in dialogue about our justice system. It's like, it's come full circle in a way, wouldn't you say? I think that's a powerful insight. And it speaks to something we've been circling all episode. Philadelphia is a city where layers of history are constantly interacting with the present, prompting us to confront the complexities of our past and how they continue to shape our present. So what started as a deep dive into a seemingly random collection of sources about Philadelphia Bridges, history, even a hard rock cafe, has turned into this thought-provoking exploration of urban planning, revolution, and the evolving meaning of progress. And that's the beauty of digging beneath the surface, isn't it? You never know what connections you'll uncover. Philadelphia, for all its contradictions, invites us to do just that, to explore its layers, to challenge our assumptions, and to uncover those hidden stories that make it such a captivating city. It makes you wonder what stories those walls of Eastern State Penitentiary would tell if they could talk, right? Indeed. And perhaps, even more importantly, what stories will Philadelphia tell about itself in the centuries to come? And that's something I think you, our listener, are uniquely positioned to discover. So the next time you find yourself standing outside that Hard Rock Cafe, take a moment to listen to the city around you. You might be surprised by what you hear. This has been The Deep Dive, and we'll catch you next time.